Gilbert Gottfried. This is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast. I'm here with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. Our guest this week is an actor, director, producer, and musician who's been working pretty much nonstop since the age of 22 when he played Billy Crystal's young in-law in Mr. Saturday Night. Since then, he's had memorable roles in films such as Dazed and Confused Before Sunrise, Ed TV, Two Days in Paris, A Beautiful Mind, and Saving Private Ryan. Memorable TV roles include Chandler Bing's Crazy Roommate Eddie on Friends and his recent turn as hitman Mr. Numbers on the TV version of Fargo. He can currently be seen in our pal Jim Gaffigan's show entitled The Jim Gaffigan Show. Please welcome a man much too young to be a guest on this podcast, <laughs> the multi-talented Adam Goldberg. Uh, hello, I'm Adam Goldberg doing my radio voice. Oh, good. Wow. Nice, it, right? Yeah. Resident. It, I like it. it it's, you're practically Arthur Godfrey. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Adam. Um, Thanks for doing hey, it. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Can I make two minor tweaks to that otherwise really impressive uh, introduction? Oh, yeah, hit myself. it. Perhaps, yeah. perhaps the most impressive introduction to myself I've ever been uh, listening <laughs> to. Um, I, I, uh, <laughs> this is only because I'm now old and vain, uh, <laughs> but I believe I was 21, but I, I think I was 21 when I did this. Sorry, <laughs> Okay. You're going to shave a year that's off. Essential. That's I just shaved. A, I mean, strictly speaking, I might have been like 21 and a half, but I was still under 22. And then for whatever reason, for many years uh, on IMDb, the Internet Movie Database that so many of us rely on, uh, I have been listed as a character in Before Sunrise as man sleeping on train. I don't know who... I'm going to guess Drew was sleeping on that train, but uh, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't me. So I you're, don't know. You're what, not in what, Before what, Sunrise. I am not in Before Sunrise. It's true that many years later, Julie and I yeah. would be uh, do a movie called Two Days in Paris together. But I don't know. Yeah, very early on, for some reason, they listed me as a as like an, as, a, as a feature extra in Before Sunrise. But now, uh, now, anyway, other than that, well, we'll swap um, out Zodiac then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Throw that in there. It's just and, and with maybe your voice and Zodiac. Um, <laughs> now, anyway, guys. Frank told me something that I found very upsetting before we spoke <laughs> to you. That you're only half Jewish. This is uh, this is a source of some consternation and yes. and I dare say disappointment to to, to some uh, to some people generally of the Semitic faith. Um, I, uh, I'm half, I'm half, but as a, as a good friend once told me, uh, it's the half that runs the show. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure what that means. when I, when, well, I, I think I said something like, but I'm only half Jewish. And he said, but it's the half that runs the show. Um, and so, uh, my old friend Bobby Pastorelli told me that. So anyway, yeah. Um, my mom is actually quite not Jewish, uh, or like non-Jewish Germans. How do you like them? Oh, jeez. I don't know and, if I want you as a guest. <laughs> <laughs> but I've done, I've, I've done plenty of recon on the subject, and there doesn't seem to be any collusion there. And, um, and so I think, we're, I think we're safe. There was the, the, the emigration you know, was very early. And, uh, and uh, Irish and French and um, Mexican, actually more substantially Mexican than I realized uh, until uh, very recently, actually. And how were you um, raised? Uh, at Mexican. <laughs> really? <laughs> just, 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 just like a, just like a, you know, a young, uh, it's, a, it's a handsome Mexican young man, I guess. Um, I um I was re- my mother disavowed her Catholicism uh, 
by which she was raised pretty pretty early on, I would guess, in her uh, post-adolescent life. And so by the time she had me, I think she was as much interested in me going to a Jewish, uh, you know, day school as my uh, ostensibly Jewish father. So I went to like six years of Jewish day school, but by the time, so that was like first through sixth grade, but by the time I was done with that, I was sort of, I was kind of like <clears throat> Jewed out a little. And, uh, you know, I went, and so I, you know, I didn't even get bar mitzvah actually. I mean, that's, that's, which at the time seemed to me to be like, the kind of, I mean, it wasn't even a stand I was taking. I just didn't want to do the work. It seemed exhausting and redundant given the fact that I had gone through six years of parochial school, you know, and, uh, but really I felt like it would be hypocritical because, you know, I, I wasn't going to believe in anything I was saying. And it seemed, you know, I think I, I had like the, I was being a little holier, so to speak, than now about it. But of course, like come time to like have to, you know, like buy my first car uh, and I cashed out the stocks my grandfather gave me like when I was born. Uh, then I thought, no, it probably would have been good to have uh, had a, a bar mitzvah if it were as lucrative as some of my friends, uh, you know, for. <laughs> Gilbert, did you have a bar mitzvah? No. Oh, no. okay. I'm... I'm always, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm one of those people who always feels like, like if the Nazis came back, I'd be. I'm like I don't follow any of the holidays. Right. I don't really follow the Jewish faith, but I I consider it like if the Nazis were to come back, I'd be thrown in with all the other Jews, so I'm a Jew, and right. there's no way around it. I mean, should there be yeah. a, 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 major, uh, a major renaissance of that, of that a particular ideology? So the Hebrew hammer yeah. himself is only half Jewish. No, I know. And also, I had a bunch of tattoos, and I was like, ah, it's way too hard to cover these up. I mean, people have complained about that, and we would rationalize it. Well, you know, an Orthodox Jew also wouldn't do this and that, and he's a badass, and I don't know what kind of other right. rational relations. And, and one of your like, tattoos was a swastika. Yeah, it was a swastika. That one we covered up. We made it look like a, like a whatever, an Anasazi. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, now, uh, now, look, I think, I'm pretty sure I had on maybe the entire cast of Dazed and Confused on an episode of um, USA Up All Night. Oh, is that where you think that we met? I Yeah, I'm wondering. Well, he I, remembers McConaughey. I remember McConaughey. And well, he, how can he, you forget McConaughey? He seemed like you he didn't for, want... Yeah. You can he, forget me. I mean, uh, uh, the question... The, you, you, when would this have been? Uh, oh, God. How many years Well, that was the movie's that? 93, right? So how yeah, to, how, I can I can I can count to you. I can count on one, maybe finger, but definitely hand the amount of press that I would have been involved in at that stage in my oh. career. And I think it was like Film Threat magazine and Interview magazine did a piece like on the whole movie. So there's a little square, tiny yearbook picture type thing of me in that, and. Uh, that's it. I mean, I don't, you know what I mean? But I had no, I mean, I mean, there was no public. I mean, I don't remember doing anything for that. Yeah. I, um, and I then rem- McConaughey though, you know, pretty much when that movie was wrapped was like on his way to like some version of stardom at that point. I mean, he was like, and I remember I met the guy. I was like, who's it? He goes, oh, this is so cute. I remember the other thing's sweet. This guy's a bartender and like, you know, he's, He's in the movie, and that's oh, that's that's adorable. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, cut to like three months later, and he's like, we're visiting him in Malibu, you know, where he's got his first place, and you know, I don't know how many months later, but it was within that year or something. So, I mean, clearly things were, you know, he was already kind of working up to that next, you know, echelon or whatever. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, there's no, I, there's just no version of me forgetting something like that. Yeah. I, um, I, 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 as I remember it, I don't think McConaughey wanted to appear on up all night. <laughs> 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 what was his problem? He was too, is he, I mean, come on. Yeah. He wasn't going, you know? all right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you remember you remember Joey Lauren Adams, and you remember McConaughey. 
Who yeah. else do you remember? Was Nikki Cat or um, hmm. Parker, Come on, you Parker Posey? Nikki was on that, and I wasn't. That, this, yeah, this is doesn't start, make sense. To start, well, <laughs> well, he's saying to who I should go back and fucking yell at. He's saying the um, whole cast. Like, I'm imagine, trying to imagine who it was. We'll we'll dig it up. There's Adam. no there's no there's no record of this. Like we can't. <laughs> it's a basic table. I mean, what's, yeah. what, what's, what's more frightening, obviously, is the prospect that I've somehow managed to like eradicate this from my memory and that I should go seek medical attention immediately <laughs> because like there's just no version of me forgetting anything like because everything was so fucking new to me and like exciting and like there's just there's just not a version of me doing something like that where I wouldn't remember or be like totally titillated by it so now, I don't know now uh, one thing that I, I want to ask the excitement level uh, when you found out you were uh we're going to be doing a, a Steven Spielberg film. Yes, yes. I, it's Saving Private Ryan. What, what, yes. when, what was that like? That experience. It to- was. It was a multifaceted experience because. So this is how it goes down: is, is that first I get a a script, and the script um, is one thing, and and it was confusing because. There weren't, there weren't, there weren't actually, there wasn't actually really a role in there for me. The closest to a role was Ryden, which was the, the uh, Eddie Burns role, but he had already been cast by the time I read that script, so it was totally unclear to me even what I was reading for. And they didn't have us read from the script itself. They had us read from uh, scenes from A Midnight Clear, which was a, a World War II film. A really great one, made a few years before with Ethan Hawke and Oh yeah. I uh, that film. Yeah. So we were reading from that and I kinda just picked like an attitude, I guess. I mean it was a weird audition. Like I sort of picked a guy and I made him real New Yorky and kind of tough or whatever. I guess kind of with the mind that the Ryden thing hadn't been totally solidified or maybe Eddie wasn't attached yet. I, I don't know. And um and I, I was on the way there. And, or I was about to go there. I was like pulled over on the side of the road or something like that. Cause I'm trying to remember, I certainly didn't have a cell phone. So I don't know how I would have made this call, but, but somehow I had a, a called my agent and, and I said, like, I just don't think that there's a point in going in on this. I'm like, I don't get what I'm doing. Like, I'm, I feel like I'm going to embarrass myself. And blah, blah, blah. he wasn't there by the way. We were put on tape by Denise King and a great casting director. And, uh, and he was like, you're an idiot. Just go in. I was like, all right. So, you know, I go in, I do whatever. Um, and I literally forget about it. It wasn't one of these things where I was, oh, fuck, man, you know, and you're like, you know, you're calling and you're and you're waiting, a, you know, dated breath and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I just really had dismissed it um, pretty much out of hand. And I was at my uh, girlfriend at the time's house sleeping late, which I'm wont to do. And uh, I literally woke up with my manager uh, standing up for me because he couldn't get in touch with me because I guess, I don't know, I had a pager. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck I had. <laughs> um and he couldn't get in touch with me, and he was standing over me, and he goes, it's my, my old man, <laughs> he was like, oh, Alan Summers, he goes, uh, how'd you like to go to England for three months this summer? Um, I don't know why I'm making him sound like John Wayne. He doesn't sound like John Wayne. But, um, <laughs> so for, that's my best impression it, for some reason. Sound, it's a better story that way. It's a better story. Yeah. So <laughs> how'd you like to go to England this summer for three months? Um, and I said, uh, I don't, I probably said not really. Cause like, you know, I don't like traveling. You're a bad but, flyer. Uh, we should point that out. I'm a horrible flyer, horrible flyer. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you about the trip on the way to Saving Fair Ryan. It's fucking one of the worst flights I've ever been on. But, um, <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I'm dragging this out. Basically he, he explains to me that I'm in the movie and I got very excited, but then I realized I didn't know what I was doing in the movie. Um, and he goes, I don't know. I don't know. We're going to find out. They're going to write a part or something like that. And so then I was waiting to see what they wrote because I knew I was in it and that they were adding these two characters and that was mine and Vin Diesel's character, but I just didn't know what that part was going to be. And then I went in to have like a secret whatever, like, you know, uh, went, went back to probably, I think, to the East Jamian's office. They put me in a room. They stuck me with a script. I read it. I had to leave it there. And, um, you know, and I read what the role was and the role actually evolved quite a bit up until literally the day of shooting it changed, um, several times kind of drastically, but, um, anyway, um, but it was like, uh, it was, it was super exciting, but it was also this kind of weird dragged out process where I was like, 
uh, you know, it was kind of unclear what I was doing. I mean, honestly, to a certain extent to the day that we shot, because again, initially I was like a, I was, a, I was basically initially the role that you see in the, in the film. Then there was a massive rewrite done. And, and, and I got these pages while we were like in boot camp or just prior to going to boot camp. So, and, and, and they all suddenly had me being this kind of like uh, dullard, which was like bizarre, but they still had some pages left over from me being a wise ass. And, and, and I, I don't know, this, this gets went back and forth for a while. And so finally it ended up being the part that I played, but it was, uh, it was, uh, it was definitely always in flux. Even the way I get killed in the movie, initially I was supposed to just get shot while I'm running. I think it's helpful. Um, so yeah. Anyway, yeah, the flight and, there. Uh, and you horrible. went to boot camp to prepare well, for yeah. this. All the we actors. To, they put us in a boot camp. You know, keep in mind. You know, you could see if you squinted the production office from where we were. Oh. But uh, <laughs> but but yeah, we were we were we slept in tough tents. We got you know three hours of sleep or something, whatever a night. We were up at five a.m. doing like a sort of like. And uh, what felt like an infinite amount of running. It was like more running than I, I was like capable of doing, and um, and training and and uh, and we would have uh, you know simulated uh, we would do you know simulated uh, 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 battles you know exercises and things like that. Uh, it was it was it was pretty intense, and uh, I mean it was not like anything I had ever experienced. I mean I, I you know I was like at the time. <clears throat> not in awful shape. In fact, me and Giovanni Rabisi, who had been friends for years um, prior to going to England had taken um, boxing classes. We were going and getting <laughs> boxing training. Um, and, you know, cause we thought, okay, that's a really rigorous, you know, intense form of athletic training. And, you know, it's a lot of running and it's blah, blah, blah. And we're going to have like, you know, we're going to have our, our lungs are going to just be like, you know, com- you know, completely like, immune to whatever it is that they, they, they sort of throw our way. And honestly, the first day, I think he and I were like two of the people, I think Sizemore was down first. And then, uh, and then like he and I, like, you know, were like bending over with our heads between our legs, you know, trying to catch our breaths. And, um, and then at a certain point, you know, towards the like last, you know, day or so, we all started to like freak out because we were going to start shooting. We were only given like a day between the boot camp and shooting. And we were all, we all just thought we were going to get sick and we couldn't take it anymore. So we went to Hanks and we said, you know, is there any way we can negotiate our way out of this? And we basically <laughs> struck some sort of, cause Hanks could have done this forever. I mean, he literally, it's a, I mean, is it ran circles around us? Um, and, uh, you know, I think we negotiated down the boot camp from like six days to five days or something ridiculous. But, um, but it was, uh, it was still, uh, it was really intense and it totally changed my whole, I mean, it worked. It, it, it was, it's that, even that kind of little bit of indoctrination into that sort of mindset and that world and that sense of camaraderie and, and even a, a kind of an, an empathy or, you know, with the, with military life that I, I mean, I never had, um, you know, it, 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 it I, I always, think I came out of that situation like changed. I mean, yeah, to a certain extent, the film, but really that, that, that initial experience. And it was shot, we should point out, Adam, that it wasn't, it wasn't shot in Normandy. It was shot in, in Ireland and the UK. That's correct. The, and, the D-Day sequence was shot in Ireland and right. the rest of it was shot uh, yeah, outside of London. And so tell us a little bit about the bad flight. And if I have my, my, my research correct, there's, there was something about you have, you were just, you had just finished watching every airport movie. Oh no! Well, no, that's just that's a recent flight. I oh, oh okay, recently. I got them. I yeah, got yeah, them yeah. mixed up. Yeah, no, I mean, I, every flight's a bad flight for me. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a matter of degrees, right? And it's a matter of the efficacy of you know the Ativan uh, come you know alcohol content. I feel you, man. Um, I don't like to fly thing. either. Yeah. So uh, no, it was just a really, really bumpy flight. It's the kind where people were like looking at each other. And, uh, I can't remember if I grabbed the person next to me or not. Um, it was a, it was a really bad, so was the flight on to Austin on, on Days and Infused. I mean, I don't know what the, the story is here. It's never great flying in Austin, but there was like, I don't know, maybe half the cast roughly, or at least a bunch of the LA cast were on the, uh, uh, the flight I was on to, to, to Austin. And 
we all were like screaming literally during the descent because the plane was being like struck by lightning. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> um, and I was like, is this going to be like? I mean, it couldn't. It couldn't quite be the Big Bopper, Richie Valens, you know, <laughs> Buddy Holly flight, right. because nobody was was that. Nobody would have given a shit. <laughs> but it would have been like, oh, remember that that plane that carried the, carried the initial cast members of the, the guys that were first cast in Daisy Confused, <laughs> you know, that they had to replace. It would have been that flight. The guys you know? that weren't Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, Matthew didn't have to go anywhere because he was like, he was like, hey, man, I'm. Uh, I live right down the street, man. They come by after after the shoot, and we have three dollar beers tonight. Now, what um, do you remember about Spielberg? Do, anything in particular? His methods of directing you? He, he was like, I mean, but, you know, there were definitely there was this thing where it was impossible to track from for me anyway what he was doing technically as a filmmaker, you know, which I was interested in because so much of what he did in that movie, from my understanding anyway, was like inside his head. You know, he didn't have storyboards, I don't think. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'm sure this could be, it's probably Googleable, but um, I remember he had just done Amistad and he talked about how he shot that in this very sort of regimented way and how he wanted to shoot this in a much more, you know, spontaneous way you know, in an almost sort of cinema verite way, he would, he had us actually improvise an entire scene, which I ultimately, I think got cut in its entirety from the movie, but he had us uh, improvise an entire scene where all of us in character talk, spoken to a tape recorder and, um, and we're talking about death, about dying and um, in, you know, in character. And that scene was transcribed just, you know, to some degree, um, or that transcript was trans uh, was transcribed into the into uh, a scene in the film that we shot and that again was later cut out. But um, he was like re- really relying upon uh, uh, actor input. I mean, I think part of the rationale behind the casting at the time, which people would describe as like indie film casting, I guess, um, was that you know he was using um, you know using actors in a very collaborative sort of way and very different than he had on on, on some of the other you know sort of big famous films that he's done. Um, but, uh, but he was, you know, he was also very like, you know, if he disagreed with you, he let you know. And I would, you know, we would, we got into, we, 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 we got, we argued about how much I should curse because I was cursing a lot. And there was a lot of sort of back and forth about how much and how little these guys back then used the word fuck. I remember that was the one time we like, I'm not going to say we butted heads. In fact, we had a really terrific relationship and he was super helpful later on. I had a, my first movie, Scotch and Milk, that I had written and directed prior to that and, and he watched that movie and he got me involved with DreamWorks' post production to help me finish the film and all this other stuff. But um but yeah, we I remember we we we, we sort of butted heads about how much I should say fuck. Um but um <laughs> but he was like super he was he was you know he would eat lunch with us. He was he was I think it was really important for him to be as integrated into sort of our world um as possible. I mean I think he really wanted us all to feel like you know, uh, kind of a family, which which I think we did. Was there a crying scene, uh, Adam, that you had some problem with or difficult dif- uh, difficulty? <laughs> oh, right, right, right. So, so one day, I mean, again, you know, there was a lot. There's so many elements of this film which were so spontaneous, or or not uh, at least you know scripted necessarily. Um, and so, yeah, I'm supposed to find this Shabbat challah cutter thing in the beginning of the film, right, right. after the B-Day sequence. And so one day we're at lunch. And uh, I think I'm like going to get like my like potatoes and like more potatoes because you know we're in Ireland. And uh, and he says like, um, okay, you, you know, you know, when you find the Shabbat Holocaust uh, today, uh, uh, cry. And I was like, uh, okay. And you know, you just I just started flashing through every Spielberg movie I'd ever seen. Like I started flashing through like you know Drew Barrymore's Tears, you know, and like ET or. You know, Henry Tom or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like all the good Spielberg tears. I was like, I just can't deliver this. You know, <laughs> uh, I mean, there's just no way I can. Deli- I mean, it's like it's, it's like being asked to. I mean, if he had said, okay, um, so you know, when you find the Shabbat Hollow Cutter, uh, get an erection and fuck size more. You know, it would have been the same thing. You know. Um, <laughs> oh, that would have been acting. <laughs> <This is> stressful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, 
How does your character sure. come to be named Mellish? Because I know you're a Woody Allen fan, and Woody Allen's character, of course, in Bananas is fielding Mellish. I don't know if yeah, you ever I put... Believe... That was the first thing I said when I read the script. I was like, is there any way we can change the character's name <laughs> from Stanley Mellish <laughs> to Stanley any fucking thing else? Um, I figured and... that would resonate with you since you're such a Woody fan. Right. No, I, yeah. I said, I go, the world is going to think... Right. That it's like a ju- like a play on on fielding knowledge. Like I don't understand, <laughs> and and they're like nobody. They're like nobody cares. Nobody nobody's thinking this. I'm like, but that's impossible. I mean, it's like I'm playing a Jew and named Mellish. Like how is that not fielding Mellish? I mean, I mean you're picking at a scab here. Yeah. I mean I don't know what to tell you. Um, it was uh yeah. I'm, I'm not, I mean to this day I guess it's. I mean, it just goes to show you how these people, I guess, know field and knowledge. But well, I, I just you, hard to believe. You have to be a little bit of a movie buff. I guess. Well, in in um, what was that? Uh, Kubrick's um, the Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket. There was Gomer Pyle. Oh, that's right. But that was his nickname. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was what they yeah, were calling right. him. They were calling. He, he was. You mean Vincent D'Onofrio's character oh, yes. was Pyle? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but wasn't – when was that on, though? I mean, that wasn't that a play on that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. think they were, they were mocking him by calling them that. Right, right, right. L- little aside, Adam, you know, in booking the show, Gil- Gilbert said to me a couple of weeks ago, and we, we, we have a very interesting process of booking <laughs> guests, and he said to me, hey, you know the woman and the, the, the actress, the, the, the Vietnamese woman in full metal jacket? I want to get her on this show. The one who said – me so horny Be- because I think me so horny me rub you wrong time is yeah. as prominent. It's I- it is. It's iconic. Yeah. Yeah. It's like no, just right. as big as this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship, or we're not in Kansas anymore. Right. Uh, what are we going to talk to her for the other for the rest of the hour about? Oh, we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll talk to her for about a minute if she even speaks English. I don't know if she speaks English. I mean, but, these but are the no, requests. You I might get. find that it could be a fascinating story. What if she? I mean, you, you never know what you're going to unearth. Maybe she's maybe she's like uh, you know, the lead that's incredibly like rich, fascinating life has nothing to do with that film. And, uh, you know, you're making news. I think you've got to find her. Or I maybe, mean, it probably maybe won't she, be that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe she really is a hooker now. <laughs> I mean, for a while. I know. mean, <laughs> it's possible that also she's so horny and, uh, <laughs> and you know, and that's sort of a win-win, you know, for well, everybody. Well, then I definitely want her on the show. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> it's a challenge. But yeah, uh, that is a great... Yeah, that's like that's during like the like the these boots are made for walking is playing, right? It's not the now, Yeah, oh yes, yes. Now right. now Tom Hanks name in Saving Private Ryan was Rufus T. Firefly. Now get out of here now. <laughs> 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 but, but he's managed to get that changed for yeah. some reason. I don't know. He had, a, he had more, he had more pull than I did. <laughs> now you're a, you're a movie buff, Adam, and I've I've mm-hmm. I, I've researched and did a couple of listened to a couple of interviews uh, with you, and you're talking about other movies. Yeah. And since we're talking about Woody. You know, you grew up. Uh, well, 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 by Woody, who he means, you know, right. getting a hard on. <laughs> that fucking Tom Sizemore. <laughs> yeah. well, you're talking about Woody Herman. Yeah, the, Woody uh, Herman, right. The, the, Woody the, Woodbury. I'm sorry, Woody Guthrie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I heard you say, and I was telling Gilbert, that you were watching Hannah and her sisters. You were <laughs> you had an anxiety attack when the character has his anxiety I, attack? I had, an, I had an anxiety attack watching Woody Allen have an anxiety attack. Um <laughs> I mean, I don't actually know that it concurred with the scene or scenes in Hannah and Her Sisters. Uh, like, I don't know if it was like a total, like, sort of mirror image that was that was taking place. But, but yes, I, I, I was about to say I used to have really bad anxiety problems. I mean, I still do. Um, but I had, you know, sort of developed them acutely when I was like 13, like, well, when I was 13. And so this was, I guess, when I was 15 years old, went to go see Hannah and Her Sisters and... I, every once in a while, would get these kind of panic attacks in any kind of closed space or pretty, pretty much any, any, any place that was, that was, uh, that felt like an unleavable situation. Like, you know, like going to see a play was the worst. 
because, you know, you can walk out of a movie and sort of embarrass yourself in front of your friends or whatever, but, you know, you walk out of a play and, you know, you get the guys on stage, <laughs> you know, like, to be, what the fuck, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, so, yeah, I just had a, <laughs> I, had, I had to leave. Hey, um, getting back to something the, uh, we were discussing before, this just came into my head. Uh, Donald Sutherland's name. Can't can't wait to see where you're going with this. Yes. Donald <laughs> Sutherland's yeah. name in Day of the Locust was Homer Simpson. That's right. Oh, shit, you're right. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> He's humoring you, Gilbert. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a movie worth seeing if you've never seen it, Adam. What's that? Oh, I've seen, I've seen it and I've did, read it. I, oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, Homer Simpson, oh, right. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, yes, I very pretentiously refer to Day of the Locust in my first movie, the one I was just referring to, Scotch and Milk. Oh, really? She mentioned, yeah, yeah, I, I was, yeah. I'm like a big, like, I mean, that's not a noir per se, but a big, uh, you know, sort of L.A. of that era. Yeah, John Schlesinger, uh, right? I think, oh, well, yeah. John I, to direct that? I, think, I mean, I think he did. Because I always think it, it's, the, it's one of the few instances where I think so. I mean, I'm really not that literate. I own a lot of books. I've read very few of the ones that I own. Um, they impress people. Um, now they're like in my baby's room. So uh, he appears extremely literate. But um, but Day of Locust is one of those where I actually remember the book better than I do the film. But was that John Schlesinger? I believe it was. Yeah. Well, our, um, our crack research team comprised of, of uh, Gilbert's wife is now looking it up. And Alta Vista. Burgess Meredith. Uh, who's that? William Atherton. Oh, yes. Karen, oh, yeah. He's that right. Ka- Karen yeah. Black. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, I you... always remember, I remember the ending well. Well, you're a filmmaker yourself. I mean, what, what kind of films did you watch growing up in L.A.? I mean, you were a latchkey kid. And I, 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 I saw you. T- John Schlesinger. There you go. Good hey, call. I feel good about myself. Now, you I was should. I, I was, feel really horrible about myself. You made your guest <laughs> feel horrible. I mean, he started out feeling horrible, but now he's like, "Oh God, he couldn't even get the fucking Schlesinger reference." <laughs> Fuck me. T- t- tell, Gil- uh, tell Gilbert about acting acting out scenes from. He found this fascinating that you acted out scenes from Robbie Benson's movie One on One when you were a can, kid. Can you do a scene from yeah. from One on One? From One on One, please. I, I think that. <laughs> I don't remember. We do deep I research, watch, Adam. I would watch. I know you went deep. I would watch. I would like to watch one on one now just to see if it jogged anything from my adolescence. But yeah, I had just seen Rocky like in the theater, and then I saw one on one like on Z Z Channel. You guys know Z Channel? Oh yeah, yeah. The channel was like this amazing cable station. Right, right, right. Um, oh my god, I remember. Thought someone, of it in years. Yeah. Okay, in now, now do a scene from Rocky, please. <laughs> <laughs> the scene that I did. Okay. The, the, the scene that I did for my for my father when he came to pick me up one weekend uh, <laughs> uh, uh, from my mother's house was me was was when he eats the raw egg. I don't even know where the one on one thing was. I think it was like I'm a basketball player, but what? I'm eating a raw egg. Like that was like, <laughs> like that was like how I fused it. Keep in mind, I'm like seven years old here, right? And so, and so I did an orange juice thing instead of the egg, which I thought was pretty clever. And it was just like me getting ready to go out. And that was the scene. It's, it's what I would later learn. <laughs> like, actually, sort of an acting class day where you, like, create a moment or some shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but I don't know what made it have anything to do with that Robbie Benson film other than the fact that I probably prefaced it by saying, and I'm a basketball player or something. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was, yeah, I was, uh, I, you well, know, then I saw like, I saw them do Macbeth at, at, at the Jewish community center. And so I came wow. home that night, made my mother, my mother's boyfriend and my, uh, and myself, uh, reenact some sort of sword fight scene for my father, which I'm sure like, I mean, if you just think of the edible implications alone <laughs> and then you, <laughs> You throw in, you know, just my father having to like purchase a ticket in order to watch this. Um, you know, his 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 not very long at that point ex wife, you know, have you know, sword fight with this kind of strapping blonde guy who was her ex or her boyfriend at the time. Um the whole scene is just uh it's unsavory. 
Well, you, your your mother was a therapist. I mean, we should point out that you had no uh, no connection to the business at all. No, no, no. She wasn't a therapist at the time. Oh, she, I see. She later become a therapist. But uh, but but no. I mean, except for the fact that we. In fact, he was like a. Her boyfriend at the time was like a. I believe he was like a music agent. But um, you know, uh, no. My father was in the was in the wholesale food business. He had a had a business that he he recently finally um, retired from called Goldberg and Solvey Foods. And uh, my mother kind of did a bunch of things after my parents split up. And then when she was. I think like 40 went back to school or maybe in her late thirties went back to school. And anyway, now she's, yeah, she's been a therapist for, you know, 25 years or whatever. Now, now can you yell out at least yo Adrian? I mean, as well as you can, I mean, <laughs> yo Adrian. <laughs> Very good. Yo, Adrian. Yo, Very, Adrian. All right, let me tell you. Yo, Adrian. Yo, Adrian. You know, I mean, I guess, yeah. I don't even know that I bothered. I'm telling you, it began and end with that that, that riot. But but you and, what, oh, and, and and then I and then I you know I wanted to become a boxer. That was the other thing. I wanted to become like some sort of weird boxer after hybrid. I guess I wanted to be Mickey Rourke before there was Mickey Rourke. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, you know what I mean. Like I came out of Rocky. It was that thing where movies were. It was unclear to me, like. I don't know if it was unclear to me. Thinking back on it, it seems unclear how much I wanted to emulate what was going on in the films and how much I wanted to actually then become. I think that has a lot to do with at least why I wanted to, to be an actor was to was was to lose myself in that world. And the only way to actually do that, because I wasn't ever going to be a boxer or like a skydiver or, you know, whatever the hell else I thought was, you know, um, kind of you know exciting or entertaining to me was 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 to you know become an actor. You started taking acting lessons, acting classes? I mean, yeah. I mean, I did like, you know, I did like, um, I made plays in school and I took acting classes from, uh, you know, the time I was about 14 on um, uh, outside of school. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I went to acting classes. Now, what do you think was the dumbest and most pretentious shit you ever heard in an acting class? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, what's the dumbest and most pretentious shit you've ever done? And I was going to be like, yeah, Jesus. No, we don't have that much time. <laughs> no, no, we don't have that much time. I mean, I was, just, I was just going to try and catalog the pretentious shit I've done and said today alone. Um, uh, the most pretentious thing I ever heard in acting class. I mean, I don't know. I, I Honestly, a, a lot of a lot of that the whole period of my life. I, I mean, I actually stopped going to acting class. I mean, it seems sort of, I don't know, saying it seems sort of snooty or something, but I, 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 I stopped going after I, I got dazed and confused. And, and I think it was partly because I think I was in that acting class. I, look, basically, I came home from, from a year of college, got, uh, uh, like, had, you know, what I, what I like to refer to as a nervous breakdown. Was it Strictly speaking, one, I, I don't know. It, it sounds much better just to say I had a nervous breakdown at college. I came home. My, my girlfriend, who was like my first girlfriend, <clears throat> dumped me. Um, I was abjectly miserable, and I said, I'm going to join an acting class, and I'm going to get an agent, and I'm going to get a girlfriend. And that's basically what I did. Um, <laughs> nice recovery. And so, yeah, <laughs> I like that. That's my recovery program. So coincidentally, the guy who screened the actors to the class left to become an agent and they, his name is Stephen Levy. He was my agent and the agent of many guys, you know, Mike Rappaport and started with a bunch of us when we, you know, I had done nothing. Um, you know, so he, he, you know, began to represent me, you know, probably a year or so after that. Um, I mean, I, again, I had been in like, you know, kitty acting classes when I was 14 and 15 and 16, but you know, this was like, you know, whatever, the kind of real deal thing. And then, um, you know, I think there was, yeah, part of me was doing it in order to try and find a way into the sort of business end of things a little bit, as much as I actually wanted to do the work. Um, but um, I've always had a, an ambivalent relationship with acting. So, you yeah. know, um, I, I heard yeah. you say, I heard you say you feel bizarre when you're acting. I don't know that. I mean, is that true? I, yeah, I don't know what that what that was, I would have to know the context of that statement. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> I don't, I, I, you have to give me a little bit more. Cause I, I mean, already in this podcast alone, I've said a thousand things 
I probably won't remember. <laughs> um, but <laughs> can, can I tell you something? I think every single guest we've had on this show has yeah. called us the next morning saying, can you cut out that part? Where oh, oh, of course. That <laughs> of course. No, the, sometimes the we whole, do it. No, yes. the whole, the, the, it's, it's terrifying because the podcast thing on the one hand is amazing, right? I've been doing them. I listen to them. I enjoy doing them. I enjoy listening to them. Um, but it's terrifying because it's like, you know, first of all, you do like a radio interview, let's say, for, for years, right? You do the radio. I mean, you still do them, right? You know, 15 minutes, five minutes, whatever. Or you do an interview with something that, you know, somebody that's, that's going to go to print or even a televised interview, whatever. And it's, you know, they're so severely edited. Now, of course, podcasts are to a degree, but there is this feeling, obviously, of you losing sense of like time and space and, <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, let, everything I'm saying right now I, it, it, is being said in a kind of unselfconscious way, which is terrifying. Um, so yeah, I'm sure I'm going to wake up. Um, well, now that we're talking about it, I'm insanely self-conscious about it, but, uh, but yeah, I'm sure I'm going to wake up tomorrow. Like I, yeah, like I fucked a relative or something. It, hap <laughs> it happens, it like happens I, all like the I time. Drunk and I, that was and my I next, cousin. that actually was my next question. I can't Have answer you that on the record. We can talk <laughs> off offline about it. <laughs> Could could we ask um, about could we ask about some of your other roles? Just some some random questions. Of course, maybe, maybe these will be answers you won't regret. Wait, even more important, you're yeah. going out with Julie Delphi. <laughs> That's what he really oh, wants to talk about. De yeah, Delphi. What'd you call her? Delphi. No, but one of the Delphi with a P. Delphi. I know, but that that that's one of my few. <laughs> That's one of my sound Freudian pleasures is when her name is mispronounced. Yeah. Um, um, so, um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, we went out for about a year and a half years before we made two days in Paris. And, um, and for whatever reason, she caught me at a very vulnerable moment when, when we, when she asked me if I would participate in this project of hers because I had just been kicked out of the house by another uh, 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 young woman <laughs> and <laughs> living like in a hotel. Uh, and uh, like, it was like the next week or two weeks later or whatever. And, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't talked to, I mean, Julie and I would sort of, we didn't stay friends exactly, but every once in a while, you know, she'd call, we'd talk about it. Whatever. And so she asked me to do this movie. And at the time it seemed like, oh, you know, so much water under the bridge. And, you know, Julie and I as a couple were insane. I mean, we were crazy. I mean, it was like we were – it seemed like we existed for the benefit of entertaining our friends at dinner, basically. Um, and it was just, just like oil and oil, but it was like American oil and like French grease. Um, and, uh, you know, and so when uh, she asked me to do this film, it seemed like, you know, I bet you it's going to be a lot more fun to just be friends with Julie and work with Julie, and it's probably the relationship we should have had. And in fact, that's even how I know her. I asked her to be in a film that I had written, um, and then I had cast her in a TV show uh, that we made for ABC that never got picked up, but a show called True Love. So that's actually how I met Julie, was under the auspices anyway of, uh, of hiring her for, for work. And then, of course, uh, you know, making a pass and molesting her as, as, as you know, as, as you want to do when you're in a position of power in Hollywood. Um, and so, uh, no, you can never molest Julie. She would fucking kick your ass before you ever got anywhere near her. Um, but um, anyway, so yeah, then we did this movie together and, and we basically haven't spoken since. <laughs> Two days in Paris. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was a debacle. It's a funny it a movie. Debacle. Oh, the movie's good. I mean, yeah. I'm proud of the work of yeah. the movie. But um, when they serve you the rabbit and, and they, the father's, which are, her, the scene was sure. her, her actual parents, right? Her actual parents, yep, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, and it was a lot of improvising. Though one of the two of us, I won't say who, likes to claim that there's very little improvising in the movie. Hey, those are my dogs. Uh, perfect timing. <laughs> Thanks, Adam honey. Goldberg's dogs, well, ladies and gentlemen. Anything else you want to have uh, delivered during the podcast? <laughs> The movie, the movie's, um, the movie's funny. I'm sorry it turned out to be a bad experience for you. 
Uh, it is funny. Um, but I thought Chris Rock played a much better me in uh, oh, two in, days in, New York. in the sequel, uh, right? <laughs> in the sequel, which uh, I had an opportunity to talk to Chris about, and I'm not saying another word about it. That's it. I, I, it was a satisfi- I'll just say it was a satisfying conversation. That's all I'm going to say. And you were in a Frankenstein movie. Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Gilbert, Gilbert's a huge I'm, Frankenstein fan. I don't know what that. I don't know what I can't remember. I mean, yeah, me and Parker Posey played detectives in the Frankenstein thing. It's a Dean, Coons, wait, wait. Dean Coons story. This this was what? in House of Frankenstein. No, it was a what? Frankenstein movie with Parker Posey and Michael Madsen and Adam. Yeah, and, uh, and we're just we're just very curious about it because we talk a lot about uh, horror films on the show, and you know, Gil, I'm, we're it in Gilbert's. Was like a, it, it was like a. It, it was in the it was in the early days of basic cable making original doing original programming, uh, like one you know so like the eighteen nineties no it was like you know it was it was, it was, it was like in two thousand and five or something like that or four two thousand four, so they were like maybe it's a movie maybe it's a movie of the week maybe it's a pilot I was like okay I don't give a shit it's work. Um, and uh, it was the guy who just directed the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, for whatever it's worth, was a very, like, you know, kind of, he was whatever, he was a cool guy. He had, you know, sort of, you know, very, you know, very visual, like, you know, technically adept director, blah, blah, blah. And it was me and Parker playing detectives in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in New Orleans. And I can't remember much else. I just remember there was a lot of running... <laughs> And, <laughs> well, you've um, done a lot of films, Adam. Yeah, and but what, I don't remember what, the whole thrust of the thing. What was Boris Karloff like to work with? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> can, can we ask you about some other randomly selected roles? For, um, from, yes, for, please, please. You, you Knock make, yourselves out. You, you, uh, we're hoping you worked with Martin Landau in the, in the Anna Nicole Smith movie. Yeah, did I actually work with him though? Well, he's in it. Uh, Maybe you didn't work with him. Did you work with Christopher no, no, Walken? No, I mean I I met him and we definitely I think we interacted in one scene. Yeah, Walken Walken was the whole thing. I mean that was my second. I mean you know Mr. Saturday Night. Okay, I always think of Days and Confused as the first movie really because I went away to do it and it was like you know I was there the whole time. Blah blah. So the prophecy of this movie with Christopher Walken was sort of like the very next summer. And it was the summer Days and Confused without. And I really was like, man, shit is starting to happen now, motherfucker. <laughs> um, cut to me now, and I'm like, you know, I'm just sort of just winded and, and dead inside. But um, <laughs> at the time, <clears throat> I was like just fucking beyond excited. And uh, I, I think it was like, I think my friend Rory Cochran was actually offered my R- part. Rory Cochran from, from Days like and that. Confused. Yeah, yeah. He was like on fire, right? He couldn't do any wrong. I think he was offered this part and turned it down or something like that. Anyway, so uh, he was off doing this movie, Eleven and Forty Five, which he's incredible in. But anyway, so um, uh, yeah, Walken was a fuck amazing. I mean, it was it was everything you wanted to be. Um, I mean, I I mean, and, and very early on, he was. Just, I mean, I, I think I think the first time I met him, I was I had just gotten off the plane. And though it was only a two-hour flight or whatever to Arizona, if that, you know, I had to take my pills. So I was like, fuck, I'm going to meet him, like, compl- like, you know, meet him. And I think we had to read, like, we were going to, like, do a quick rehearsal or something. So I'll never be able to fully recollect that interaction because I was sort of sedated. But, um, <laughs> but I'll always remember going to the strip joint with him and it taking forever. I mean, it wasn't just him. It was a big band of us going out for the night and like, you know, painting, painting, painting Phoenix red. Um, and, uh, him leaning over to me at one point after like 45 minutes in this fucking van ride to go to like some, some strip joint. Um, and him saying, this is a nightmare. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, Dude. I was like, man, that you don't want to tell me that. I mean, that's, that's a little terrifying, you know, coming from you. Um, so, um, but yeah, no, we got along uh, very well, and uh, he always he was he was always snacking. He always had like little bits of like little peanuts in his pocket and things. That's a, that's the secret to his success. And what about a movie called Salt and Sea with Val Kilmer and Meatloaf? What do you remember about that one? Meatloaf was in Salt and Sea. Yeah, 
<laughs> oh, shit, that's right. <laughs> wow. Unless <laughs> IMDB is full of shit, which we, we, we discovered tonight they're unreliable. Well, I, know, I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, you know, there was a lot of people in that movie. We didn't, you know, it's like it's a very sort of fragmented film. I mean, you know, we're all in sort of our own world. Um, but, uh, yeah, all my stuff was like with, with Peter Sarsgaard and, and, and Val. Uh, yeah, so that what was, was actually, Val that was Kilmer like to work with? Well, Val and I would later do Deja Vu together, and then I'd really get to know him, and we became pals, and we were going to do another movie together and a bunch of other things. So I, I got to know him very well. So, but in Salton Sea, I didn't know him at all. And, you know, it was like um, – and, you know, and he's playing a, a guy going undercover as a speed freak, and I'm playing a speed freak, and, you know, it was just a very kind of weird – you know, context to try and get to know somebody. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I ended up becoming for a while, you know, good pals with him, but, uh, but I remember on Deja Vu, you know, he was like, uh, he, he, the, the big thing for him was, was like, he's like, yeah, man, this is like the third movie in a row where I'm like super well behaved. So I've got to keep it together. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> um, cause he was, you know, whatever, aware of his reputation and blah, blah, blah. But, um, I mean, I just, I was always in, in awe of, of, of him and, and, uh, and just ended up having great, all these guys that have these kind of like weird reputations or whatever, like Russell Crowe was like one of the greatest guys I ever worked with. I mean, insanely generous, incredibly like protective of like other actors and, you know, I don't know. Some, some director, I read a quote, I wish I could remember his name, but he said, I, I wouldn't cast Val Kilmer in a movie as Val Kilmer in the Val Kilmer I'll, story. I'll bet it was Joel <laughs> yeah. I bet it was Joel Schumacher. Could have been. Who said that? Yeah. Well, Gil, he, oh. his name came up recently, Joel. Adam. We were talking with the, the comedian Paul Shear, and I know you're uh-huh. a, I know you're a big Brando fan as well. We were talking about Val Kilmer and Brando in the infamous Island of Dr. Oh. Moreau. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I you, mean, I can't can you even fucking begin to imagine that scene? I mean, <laughs> my God, I would honestly, I, I mean, I'm sure it probably w- would have required some travel, but uh, I would love to have been a uh, witness to that. Um, well, we loved that, 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 that Kilmer asked to be in 60% less of the film. Yeah. <laughs> I, think that was, I think that was, I think that was our favorite. And Wait, was- what happened? He he was so disenchanted with the project that he, he supposedly yeah. he asked to be in sixty percent less of the film. It's so specific. I love that number. <laughs> yeah, and, and you 61% know, one percent less. Yeah. And we you have know, a, deal. a film is completely <laughs> lost when there's one scene where Val Kilmer goes into a Marlon Brando imitation. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you seen I, Have you seen I, the movie, Adam? I, you know what? I, I don't think I. I don't think I ever have. Seen oh, you must. I, mean, I don't think I. You owe I know, it to what, yourself. I mean, yeah, I know. I know. I don't think I ever could do it, even as a. Yeah, as like a. You know, for. Yeah. Oh, and joke, tell, I guess. tell us about your your part on Friends. Oh yeah, Eddie. Eddie, yes. Well, I mean, what's to tell? I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it's haunted me for twenty years. Um, (laughs) you know, I mean, passersby shouting Eddie out of the, out of their moving cars. Um, (laughs) more people people recognize you for that than, than saving private Ryan. No, I mean, it's it's a lot. I mean, there'll be, there'll be things where it's like, oh yeah, it's Eddie from press. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter. You can work with Spielberg. You can make your own movies. You can, you can, it doesn't matter. You're Eddie from friends. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, it was actually really fun, I guess. And there's not much to tell, did, except that I did try and turn it down. Uh, uh, it was like I, I was being, um, you know, I was being uh, cocky, I guess. And so when they asked me to do it or my agent asked me, told me that there was a three-episode arc on Friends, I was like, no fucking way, man. Because I was, you know, we were all, I mean, I, you know, a bunch of us were just convinced that, like, at the time, TV was the devil, you know, and all this shit. I mean, the, I mean, the joke of it is, like, it's, it's how I've supported myself for, for the majority of my career is by doing television. I mean, I could never have supported myself by, by doing films um, solely. But, um, but yeah, but then he's like, no, you're a fucking idiot. You're doing Friends. I was like, okay. And, um, and it was only the second season. I don't even know that I'd seen it, you know. Like, I, I 
I think I, I watched the pilot of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Well, it's, but, it, um, it, it ended up being like a lot of fun. It's a credit to your talent that you're able to play such a likable psychopath. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, and then I would later go on <clears> – <throat> Much to the chagrin of diehard <laughs> friends, uh, uh, to play a completely different role on on the show Joey, Matt LeBlanc spinoff. Oh yes, right. You were Joey. Yeah, I played his friend. I played Jimmy. I played his brother-in-law, Jimmy. Um, and this just confounded people. Um, like it was not acceptable. <laughs> because you had a different fr- role in the Friends universe. Because well, I'm yeah, right. And it's right. like you know, it's a, but. You know, Jesus Christ, man! Like there were two husbands on Bewitched, you know? Right. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. And 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 right, two Jan Brady's, weren't there? Yeah, and there were two. Uh, Roseanne had two daughters. That's right. Had two daughters. Now that shit's weirder to me than if the same actor is playing a different part because right. they're actors. Right. But when you play when when two different actors play the same part. That's fucking weird, man. That's some like Louis Bunuel shit that they're pulling. Oh, and George <laughs> Burns had two different next door neighbors. Well, there was Harry Von Zell. Yeah, well, like I know, right? like Fred Clark was, was he the first or second? You got me. Yeah, but and, I and great and Gracie Allen actually totally transgender very early. <laughs> really. <laughs> Very early, uh, I don't want to say a doctor, yeah. but like. Uh, <laughs> By the way, that's the first time that Louis Bonwell has ever gotten a shout out on this podcast, Adam. So <laughs> yeah. congratulations. I'm trying to make up for the John Schlesinger, uh, <laughs> like the lack of the John Schlesinger reference. Hey, hey I wrote a show that you were on uh, called Eek the Cat. Oh, fuck yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For Savage Steve Get Holland. Get out of here. What, yeah, what, how we've... long have you been waiting? Well, you've just been holding that in your I back buried, pocket yeah, the Yeah, I buried time. the lead. I got it sitting here on a you card. buried the lead big time, dude. Yeah. Um, I, I, did it, I wrote an episode you weren't in, actually, but you did 18 okay. of them. I did one. <laughs> uh, no, I did, I did. I did. You did no, a shitload. I, I, did, I did one of those. You did one? They have, I again, one. I, I played, I, IMDB again has you down for 18 episodes. No, then I want some fucking money, man, because <laughs> that, that was certainly one of the impetus is for, for, for playing a bird was to get paid. Who did you, who um, did you I play? I did it 18 times. I played I, a bird. I, I can't uh, remember much else. Well, you and Gilbert have that I in played, common. Yes. <laughs> played a bird. And then I played a bird, I played, and I played two dogs. And that it, and that's it, and that's it. I think, in, in terms of my uh, my animal farm, can, uh, my stable. Can can we ask you about uh, the Hebrew hammer? You certainly can. Directed you mean by my, my my cock. Yeah. You want to ask about my <laughs> dick? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ask away, brother. I was try- <laughs> that's a, we deal in euphemisms here. Our, our, our friend Jonathan Kesselman made that film. So we're gonna give it give a shout out to Jonathan. Yeah, it, man. Very yeah, funny. I love that film. Yeah, very funny. It's it's. How do you describe it? I mean, for people that haven't seen it, it's a spoof of black exploitation. Well, we used to say, or John used to say, John aptly coined this term, juice exploitation film. <laughs> um, and you know, it was a. It, it, it took its initial sort of cue from you know, like black exploitation films like Shaft. So we used to just sort of say, for the sake of brevity, I was basically the Jewish Shaft. I mean, it ends up sort of lampooning other types of films and genres and things like that. But um, basically, I'm a Jewish badass shaft guy who, you know, is a private dick. I think, uh, what, is, what is the phrase? Uh, I can't remember. So, circumcised something dick. You know? Right. Uh, you, yeah, you, um, you're, you're, you're saving and, Hanukkah from Andy Dick, and from I Santa's son. Yeah, right. I save Hanukkah from, from, a, from, from a nefarious uh, Andy Dick who plays Santa Claus. What I love um, is that Melvin Van Peebles shows up. So, oh fuck yeah, man! That was so cool. Uh, Mario, uh, you know, his son is is is, is in it. We play, um, you know, we're sort of partners in the thing or whatever. I, you know, I, I go and pick him up and ask and, and enlist him to help me. And he's, um, uh, you know, so he and I are kind of go off and embark on this adventure together, or whatever. But 
uh, yeah, his dad shows up for this cameo outside of the skinhead yeah. bar scene. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's just bad. That guy is a cool motherfucker. <laughs> well, Gil- mean, he's like Gilbert and I were, we were talking about sweet, uh, sweet, sweet backs, badass song. Yeah. And just the whole history of that and how he couldn't get any studio to make that movie. And uh, I found in my. Re- I wonder why. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> I found in my research I mean, that Bill Cosby gave him 60 grand to, oh, to, shit. to finish the film. Well, yeah, to make the film. I, well, um, there is a lot of fucking in it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. What, what it would make a good do? double. It would actually make a good double feature with Pootie Tang. Because, oh, yeah, 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 because yeah, yeah. they're very they're yeah. very similar. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not a it's not an easy movie. Like I was watching everything I could get my hands on uh, at the time for that film. I mean, <laughs> bizarrely, I did a lot of preparation for the Hebrew Hammer, <laughs> um, and you know, trying to integrate as much of that influence as, as possible. But that's a diff- That's like in a different world to me than. You know, I mean, the shafts and all that stuff are, are like a lot of fun, but that's like a really kind of crazy, nonlinear, you know, trippy art film, you know? Oh, it's fun. Well, we, uh, we, we got to get some of those people on the show, like Pam Greer or, or, oh, or, some, yeah. or Richard Roundtree oh. or some of those people from, yeah. from that era who did that oh, kind of sure. stuff. And there's, a, there's a, John, tells, sure. John tells me there may be a Hebrew Hammer sequel uh, in the works. Well, yeah, I mean, for a long time, there's been this, yeah. I mean, that's sort of been floating around out there. He and I worked on a story together for it, um, and then it sort of has remained to be seen whether it would be made. But, yeah, we worked on a story, and then John wrote the, 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 the script. But um, I hope it happens. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm getting older, though, so it's like, you know, it might be like the Hebrew ham, or it might be like, you know— <laughs> You know the tired hammer, or I'm not. You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> Find a part for Gilbert in the next one. I, you're, you're in. That's it. I mean, that's that's <laughs> your. I mean, that's done. I mean, too it's bad very juice. easy to, to cast you in the film that is not getting made. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who do you? In fact, I'll, in fact, in that case, you'll uh, offer me the lead. You know, Adam, I was gonna say you're the Ibrahima. I, I thought. Just, I, there, I thought. I thought Sorry, John. You know. I, I thought That's I knew Gilbert, around. and then tonight he told me that he lost uh, the mumbles part in the Dick Tracy movie to Dustin Hoffman. Does, oh, shit. Is does, that right? Does they, that blow your that, mind? They, they were telling me for the longest time. They said, I even met with Warren Beatty. They said, oh, you're the only person we want for this. Yeah. You yeah. are it. You're it. Yeah. We, you're the one. <laughs> Anything you do with this part. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna love. It's, it's genius, yeah. Yeah, that's a and, yep, yep. and and then after months of this, my agent calls and says, "Oh, they don't want you for uh, mumbles." And I said, "Oh, well, who do they who who did they get?" And they said, "Dustin Hoffman." <laughs> well. Well, I mean, if you're going to go down, that's a yeah, pretty good way of going down, right? I want to know when me and Dustin Hoffman, like at 3 o'clock in the morning, they were going, gee, we, <laughs> we just can't decide. <laughs> and, hey, listen, like, cause, that's great. Cause I the, mean, imagine if it was like, it's, I mean, you know, I, I'm not even going to make a joke. I feel like Carrot Top gets too many oh, jokes. Oh, yes. Too easy. Never mind. But I think the only time... My name and Dustin Hoffman's name can be said in the same sentences. I've seen Gilbert Gottfried's acting, and he's no Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> and that you would have made a good ratso. Yes. Um, <laughs> and you're go- yeah, you're that, you're appearing for that. you're appearing with Jim Gaffigan on the Jim I Gaffigan. I was going to tell you my Al Pacino story. Oh, tell us. Oh, tell us. Okay. Oh, I was at the ear, nose, throat doctor today, and he came in. That's my whole story. I couldn't <laughs> oh. believe it. Um, oh, that's memorable. I mean, I don't want to make any news here. Everything's fine, I'm sure, or whatever, but I, I just, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm actually breaching some sort of weird confidentiality, except that, I mean, I have ears and eyes. There's nothing I can do about that, you know? Um, <laughs> but uh, it was, I was... I've never met the guy, and I wanted to just lunge out of my little receptacle or my little, my, you know, my little, little room they stuck me in. Um, 
and be like, and me, actor, also. But I, I didn't, I, I didn't I, do it. I, I was I, at I an eye doctor, and I, and I think I saw this character <laughs> actor, Paul Sand. Paul Sand. Yeah. <laughs> Friends yeah. and lovers. <laughs> I mean, not, not quite not a, on a not, level not, with Pacino. Not quite. But, but right. if, and, and also, you think you saw. Yeah, I think I saw. Her. <laughs> yeah, look, that's I a good know. story. Were your eyes dilated at the time? <laughs> will you do me a favor? If I ever start a podcast, will you come on and tell that story? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I, that's what's kept me in the business, uh, is my Paul Sand story. Tell, tell us about the gaffer. <laughs> Tell us about the Gaffigan show, Adam. The, the Gaffigan show. I love to laugh again with Gaffigan. Ah. Um, <laughs> that's that's the song I sing to him by his dressing room. I did. I did. I, 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 would, I, would, I would bring my guitar to work, and I would just I would serenade him by his dressing room and, and sing that laugh again with Gaffigan, and then I'd realize that he, hadn't, he was actually on set and hadn't met for 15 minutes. <laughs> but um, anyway... Um, yeah, what would you like to know? Are you? Uh, are you? Is it true you're playing a character based on our friend David Tell? No, I don't. Is that what he said? No, that's <laughs> what we hear. I think I'm like some just hybrid of, of of a bunch of guys. I mean, people have their own theories. I think Dave is one of them. I, I think see. there's a little Mark Maron. You know, there's Eddie you know, Pepitone. I, 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 yeah, it's funny. I prefer Eddie Pepitone in the in one of the episodes. I um, I, yeah, I think it's like a hodgepodge of 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 Ethnic New Yorkers that, uh, or East Coasters, or you know, New Yorker in this case, that um, you know that he sort of came up with, you know, whatever the antithesis to his, you know, sort of more family friendly, you know, uh, you know, Midwestern brand comedy is or whatever. I mean, that's the sort of you know the, the contrast. I'm just spoiled, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, um, but he had mentioned Dave at one point as as a, as a mm-hmm. sort of point of reference but yeah jim and i just met we met like you know for this thing i didn't know jim you know prior to this and he um um i think Jeannie, maybe you know his wife i think she may have thought of me for this and and we uh all three of us talked on the phone while i was in calgary doing fargo we or we skyped actually that's how we met it was via skype and um you know, and the rest is history. I go to New York for three months and live in the world's most expensive shithole of an apartment while I do this uh, television program, which costs him nothing because he's living there already. And it's on TV land. Uh, it's, the, it is on TV land, yep. and then it, like, airs again on Comedy Central. Oh, it does. And then I think it, it weasels its way into Nickelodeon, and then it finds its way onto ABC at, like, 4 in the morning, and then it sneaks onto NBC at around 6 in the morning. And then they're around. I'm kidding. Uh, I, I, I think it ends at Comedy Central. And what else is coming up that you want to talk about or that you want to plug? Got me far goes over. Well, I made a movie. I wrote, directed, a mo- co-wrote and directed a movie called No Way Jose. Oh yeah, which, tell which, us about No. T- I, tell us about No Way Jose. So that whole period while I was doing, um, so basically I was doing, uh, I was doing my film No Way Jose. And then I went off and did Fargo, and I was editing No Way Jose while I was doing Fargo, and then did Jim's pilot. During Fargo, uh, flew from Calgary one week to go to Jim's pilot and then flew back to Fargo and then they killed me. Oh, spoiler alert. Uh, and, um, and then finished my film. So that's, uh, so the film has sort of been this thread that's been woven through the last year and a half or two years or so. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a small film that I made, um, uh, starring myself, uh, regrettably. And, um, and, uh, I, you know, that I wrote for a lot of friends of mine, the kind of non-actor friends as well as people who act. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, I could go on and on about that. But that's, that's, been, uh, that's been sort of the thrust of the last couple of years. You work nonstop. We weren't bullshitting in our intro. Yeah, I mean, and when I'm not, I'm, you know, uh, masturbating. Uh, <laughs> so there's something that's being, so I'm always... Well, I'm you and Gilbert always, have that in common as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Always busy. Always stay busy. I get, you know, and I always say is, you know, if you're not, if, if you're an actor, you're an artist, musician, whatever it is, something I have, make sure you have hobbies. Make sure that you, you keep yourself occupied another way. Now, and, when and, you were um, on Friends, did you ever yeah. masturbate about Jennifer Aniston? I don't know that I did, like, there on the set. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the part you'll be calling to have taken out tomorrow. 
Adam. All right, that's the one. We nailed <laughs> so, it. Get it in under the wire. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we, uh, this is Gilbert Gottfried. This is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. And myself and my co-host Frank Santo Padre has been talking to a guy who's revealed on this episode that he fucked one of his relatives. <laughs> he, he won't say which one, but he fucked one of his relatives. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah. Fucked and, one of his relatives and, 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 and jerked off to Jennifer Aniston. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's just making well, see, a lot of news. See, the jerking off to Jennifer Aniston, everyone's done that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. But no one's done it. No one's done it while committing the act of incest. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is, while you were fucking one of your relatives... <laughs> To yeah. keep your erection going, you were imagining was, it was Jennifer imagine Aniston. Imagine Jennifer Aniston. And I think, <laughs> honestly, I think that's, that's the kind of relatable stuff that uh, I'm, I'm just constantly delivering. So you were, to, you, to, were to, fucking, to you were fucking your Uncle Morris. And <laughs> oh, think, Uncle Morris. Yeah. yeah. And thinking yeah. about Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. I was fucking my Uncle Mellis. <laughs> Mellis. Um, it's a Mellis callback. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, Adam! You, Adam, you're a good uh, sport. Anyway, it's Adam Levine, the man. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's good. <laughs> yeah, now Adam Levine will never do the show. Yeah, but see the difference. Right. The difference is Adam Levine, to the best of our knowledge, never fucked one of his relatives. <laughs> no, not to the best of our knowledge. But, but I think it's safe. I think it's safe to put it out there in the ether that he probably has. <laughs> but Adam you know? F. Chew Goldberg. For, yeah. Gold, for a guy named Goldberg to be half a Jew. I know. It's, just, a, it's, it's wrong. A, it's, it's a conundrum. <laughs> what about Whoopi Goldberg? Not too much at all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Adam, thanks so yeah. much for Thank putting you. up with us, buddy. Adam Thank you, Goldberg. Guys. And when you're, new, when you're in I'll, New York, let's do it again. Let's do it for real uh, in, in person, and, and I'll have probably a representative call you guys in the morning <laughs> to make that. Don't even wait till the morning. I'm going to compile a list when I get off the phone tonight, okay? I'll would you, would you like to plug your next uh, family get-together? <laughs> <laughs> plug being the operative word. Right. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. All right, guys. Bye, buddy. Adam have a good Goldberg. Night. Bye-bye.